All right. This afternoon, I wanted to, to speak a little bit about worship. And I put it that way because worship is a subject that exceeds the depth of any speaker, particularly when it's limited to one sermon. Now, I'm going to emphasize this afternoon one aspect of worship, one that we tend to overlook and tend to underappreciate. But before getting to that point where I want to park for a little while, before I get there, I want to touch on three other points, just as a reminder of those important truths. So I'm going to address four points, the fourth and final being the one where I'll park for a little extra time, but all of them are important. So I want to remind you of several things. And the first thing I want to remind you of is that God deserves and desires to be worshipped. He deserves and desires to be worshipped. In Psalm 96, you see, I'm going to turn over here and read it. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. God deserves and desires to be worshipped. You'll recall that God... Through Moses and Aaron, he told Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, that they may travel into the wilderness to hold a festival in his honor and to offer sacrifices to him. You see that in Exodus 3, 4, 5, 7, 8. God was delivering his son, Israel, from the womb of Egypt, that he or they might be His people, those who worshipped Him as God. He is delivering from Egypt a community of worship. People who will worship and honor and praise Him. And His desire for worship from His people, it continues into the New Testament. Jesus made this clear in His statement to the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verses 19 to 23, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So this first thing I just want to remind you of is that God deserves and desires to be worshipped. That's true in the Old Testament that's true in the New Testament. The second thing I want to remind you of is that God cares about the way in which He's worshipped. He cares about the way in which He's worshipped. The idea has crept into the church 
from our relativistic culture that God doesn't care how he's worshipped. He doesn't care about the form or the manner in which he's worshipped. We're assured that God cares only about the worshiper's heart or the worshiper's sincerity. And this claim, it's given a, a pious veneer by the suggestion that God is too big to be concerned with externals. It suggested that it's somehow beneath God to care how one expresses one's devotion to Him. But that has never been and is not now true. You see, for example, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 4 and verse 31, God tells Israel expressly that they are not to worship Him in the way the Canaanites worshipped their gods. He has His own way of being worshipped. He has His own way of being worshipped, which He prescribed in various places in the Old Testament. If, for example, the Israelites, if they used as a vehicle through which to worship Him, if they used images as a way to help them put them in touch with Him, or if they sacrificed humans in His honor, it would not be acceptable, it wouldn't become acceptable to God if they did that sincerely. If they worshipped Him in that particular manner or in that particular way with a true intent to express their devotion, God rejects worship in that form. Worship that is offered in that way. And the worshiper's intent does not baptize what is objectively rejected by God. And that's something important. And God continues to care about the way in which he's worshipped in the New Testament. This is evident from this text in John that we just read, that we just looked at. You see, Jesus makes clear in, in verse 21 that in the New Covenant, God no longer wants, to, wants worship to be at a centralized location. Whether it's Jerusalem or whether it's Mount Gerizim. And in verse 24, he makes clear that the manner of worship must be in spirit and truth. Now, I can't pause right here to pursue that with you, what I think he means by that. But the point for now is that whatever it means, it is a New Testament limitation on how one is to worship. However that is, one is to worship in spirit and truth. He cares about the form and the manner of worship. The manner of worship continues to matter to God. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we see that God has objective desires regarding worship. For example, if a woman prayed in the Corinthian assembly without a head covering, she would be worshiping God contrary to God's will, regardless of of her intent, regardless of her motivations. And if a tongue speaker used his miraculous gift to praise God in an assembly where there was no interpreter, he would be worshiping God contrary to God's will, whatever his subjective intentions or subjective state. And conversely, if one participated in a cultic meal, in an idol temple, he would be sinning. Regardless of whether that person sincerely believed that the idol wasn't real, and it was therefore simply a, a social occasion, that wouldn't change the fact. The worshiper's heart, or the sincerity of the worshiper, does not trump God's desires for how he is to be worshipped. Now, the third thing I want to remind you of is that a surrendered life, a surrendered life is the necessary context, the necessary predicate for all acceptable worship. A surrendered life, 
is the necessary predicate for that. A life of disobedience, a life of rebellion, it ruins any offering of worship, however much that offering may conform externally to God's requirements. It makes one's worship hypocritical, which is disgusting to God. He wants genuine worship. He wants a worship that emanates from a faith that finds expression in life. A faith that produces a life of justice and righteousness. This is all over the Bible. For example, in Amos chapter 5, he says, I hate, he says to rebellious Israelites, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. So here we have people living in rebellion to God, and they think they could come and offer God's, God trinkets of devotion, tokens of devotion, and somehow they think they can play God for a sap. And God tells them here, and he tells them repeatedly in other places. Before they dare come before him in worship, they must repent of their wickedness. In the words of the following verse, verse 24, they must let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You see precisely this same sentiment expressed in Proverbs 15, 8, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 17, Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 to 11, and no doubt elsewhere in the Old Testament. And in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 to 9, Jesus, he cites Isaiah's rebuke of hypocritical worship. He says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now the fourth thing, the final thing that I want to talk about, I want to mention about worship, and this is the subject on which I want to spend the remainder of our time is that preaching or teaching the Word of God is a fundamental aspect of our worship. Teaching or preaching the Word of God is a fundamental aspect of our worship. Now, it is fundamental in two distinct but related ways. First, the preached word is a manifestation of God in the assembly. He is present in and through the preached word. He speaks to the assembly and he reveals himself in that word. And thus the preached word, it serves as a catalyst to our worship our expressing of heartfelt praise of and devotion to the awesome God we meet in His Word. In Exodus chapter 4, Aaron, he told the elders of Israel the plans for deliverance that the Lord had spoken to Moses and he did the confirming miraculous signs before the people. And then in verse 31 it says, and the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. You see, that revelation of God, that word of God's care and concern and working, that word produced worship from the people. In Judges chapter 7, God told Gideon that if he was fearful of facing the Midianite army, and there were some Amalekites and some others in there, but he says, if you're fearful of facing this great army with only 300 men, 
He tells him that he should go to the Midianite camp and listen to what they say. And Gideon and his servant did that. And they heard a man telling his comrade about a dream that he had in which a cake of barley bread tumbled into the Midianite camp and flattened the tent. And the other man said in verse 14, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And then verse 15 says, Verse 15 says, As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. The revelation of God, that word confirming God's intention to bless Gideon with victory, that word produced in Gideon worship. Nehemiah chapter 9, the people of Israel, they're assembled And verse 3 says, And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 and 25, that the word of God delivered into their assembly by prophets, that it has the potential to convict unbelievers of their sin, the result of which will be their worship of God. They're declaring that God is really among the Christians. Now, in his book, Between Two Worlds, well-known evangelical scholar John Stott, he beautifully expressed, I think, this particular connection between preaching and worship. And Stott said, all worship is an intelligent and loving response to the revelation of God because it is the adoration of His name. Therefore, acceptable worship is impossible without preaching, for preaching is making known the name of the Lord, and worship is praising the name of the Lord made known. When the word of God is expounded in its fullness and the congregation begins to glimpse the glory of the living God, they bow down in solemn awe and joyful wonder before his throne. It is preaching which accomplishes this. The proclamation of the word of God and the power of the spirit of God, that is why preaching is unique and irreplaceable. Now we have that. So you have preaching or teaching The Word of God is a fundamental aspect of our worship, and I say it's fundamental in two distinct but related ways. In addition to serving as a catalyst of our worship, which I've just been talking about, in addition to functioning as an expression of God, as a manifestation of God that draws our praise and our adoration in response, Our engagement with the preached word is, or at least should be, an act of worship itself. Our engagement with the preached word of God is, or at least should be, an act of worship itself. In other words, we are to hear the word of God worshipfully. We are to hear it worshipfully. We are to ascribe to the Word of God the authority that it bears by virtue of being the Word of God. And we are to receive it as such, meaning we heed it. We listen to it rather than simply hear it. We actively put ourselves under it. We treat it as it truly is And in doing that, through that active submission to that word, we proclaim the glory and the authority of the one whose words they are. We worship in the manner of our hearing the word. Now that attitude, what I'm trying to get across to you, this attitude is in my mind encapsulated in the way that Eli told young Samuel, 
to respond to the call of the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9, he said, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And the point of that declaration, Speak, for your servant hears, the point of that declaration wasn't that Samuel had functioning ears, that he was able to hear the communication. It was a declaration of servitude. It was a declaration that he stood ready to hear as a servant. That he stood ready to receive God's message worshipfully. To receive it with its full due as the word of Almighty God. God, of course, is not identical with His Word. But His Word is a reflection of His nature. His absolutely perfect nature. And His Word comes with His full authority. We sometimes fear that we'll lapse into idolatry if we ascribe too much glory to the Word of God. But that danger didn't seem to have bothered the psalmists. It didn't seem to have troubled them. It certainly didn't keep them from praising the Word of God profusely. I mean, just in Psalm 119, just in that psalm, we see the psalmist trusts God's Word, keeps that Word, hopes in that Word, rejoices at that Word, sings of that Word, loves, delights in, and does not forget God's law. And in Psalm 56, David praises the Word of God. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary on the Old Testament, he said, the Old Testament Jew and the New Testament Christian, hearing the Word of God to the Old Testament Jew and the New Testament Christian, hearing the Word of God involves much more than sound waves impacting the human ear. Hearing God's Word is a matter of focusing our whole being, mind, heart, and will on the Lord, receiving what He says to us and obeying it. Receiving. This is an active thing that we do. It speaks of the attitude with which we engage that Word. And a very well-known uh, New Testament scholar, he's dead now, but C.E.B. Cranfield, he says something similar in an article he wrote some decades ago. He says, this hearing of the Word of God, hearing what the Lord of the church wants to say to His church in its actual situation is the primary task of the church, the basic human action in worship. It is the task not just of the clergy, but of the people of God as a whole. And as a task of tremendous urgency, is meant to be engaged in eagerly, seriously, and resolutely. The significance of preaching or teaching for the community of faith is evident in Paul's admonitions to Timothy and to Titus. He told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Until I come, apply yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to the exhortation, and to the teaching. And he commanded him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, to preach the word, to keep at it, in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and instruction. And he told Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. See, because of the significance of the Word of God for the church's life and worship, it is crucial that the Word of God be presented faithfully and that it be presented accurately. Otherwise, the community's worship is muted and misshapen and its ethics is warped. So it's no wonder that Paul exhorted Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. He tells him, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, 
an unashamed workman who correctly handles the word of truth. And it's no surprise that James warned in James chapter 3 verse 1 against becoming a teacher before one was equipped for that role. He says not many of you not many of you should become teachers my brothers because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. All are to mature to that point, but one is not to race ahead and assume that role before one is ready because it is so important for the life of the church. It's not just talking. It has great significance for the worship, the ethics, everything for the church. That's why it is so important. So I want to encourage all of us to consciously be active hearers of the Word of God as part of our worship. To be conscious of that. That as God speaks, we hear the Word of God, that we consciously and actively receive that Word, relate to that Word as God would have us do it. We put ourselves under that Word. That we do that. And I want to remind all of us who have the opportunity to teach or preach, to recognize the gravity of speaking for God and to approach the ministry accordingly. Now, if, we, if there's any way, any of you, you know how we do this. Anybody has any need, if there's anything you have with which you think we can help, we're going to sing a song and you can let you know.